Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell. On today's episode, we are speaking with Brittany Brown, Crisis Group's Chief of Staff in Washington, D.C. Before joining Crisis Group, Brittany worked inside both the Obama and Trump White Houses on Africa. She served as the Horn of Africa Director in the National Security Council under President Obama, and then she carried over briefly under President Trump as the Acting Senior Director for African Affairs. She's here to talk with us about what we might expect from an upcoming Biden administration. Brittany, welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much for inviting me. Um, so I want to ask you about what a Biden administration, you know, might mean for, for Africa. First of all, though, you were at the White House National Security Council working on Africa under the Obama administration and then briefly under Trump as well. What changed most in that transition? So... The way that it works is um, I was in the U.S. government for 10 years before heading over to the White House. And so I headed over to the White House as the Horn of Africa director in the National Security Council at the end of the Obama administration. Uh, when a new president takes over, some of the some of us that are career bureaucrats stick around. And so I stuck around um, to, through the transition from President Obama over to uh, President Trump. And then the point of all of that is that we're supposed to have a really clear, smooth transition from one president to another. And it's supposed to be continuity. So that in case anything big happens on January 20th, if people remember on President um, Trump's inauguration, we actually had a, a major situation happening in the Gambia. And so it helped to have people who had been working in the administration who, who had known all the issues and knew who needed to be involved when there was something else going on on the continent or anywhere else in the world. So when I stayed over, um, what we quickly found is that many things were going to stay the same, but some things were going to change on day one. And two of the things that happened actually on day one of the Trump administration or in that first week, actually, it's, it's hard to remember the exact day, but that first week was we saw an overturn of aspects of the Dodd-Frank Act which affected DRC and conflict minerals. And then, of course, everyone will remember the travel bans. So on day one, we suddenly saw a shift. I think we all went into the Trump administration maybe a little bit naively, thinking things weren't really going to change. Typically, things don't change that much from Democrats to Republicans, especially on Africa. You see some small changes, but for the most part, our policy has been relatively consistent at least over the last you know, 20 years, if not the last 50 years, when it comes to how the U.S. approaches Africa. So what we had then is we had this team under the Trump administration that was mostly bureaucrats, people who had committed as public servants to work for any president. I started under President Bush. I then served under President Obama and then served under President Trump. And so I stayed over there at the White House for our um, around seven months. And then in September, I went back to USAID, which was my home agency. Um, and, and can you just unpack for our listeners uh, what that change on the Dodd-Frank um, Act was and what that came out of, what change of perspective and approach from the Trump administration that represented? Yeah, so there was a lot of people um, who came in on the Trump's an initial team that came from the private sector. And one of the things that was unique about the section of the Dodd-Frank Act that affected conflict minerals was that for I think the first and only time the U.S. government was using a financial service mechanism to hold countries and governments accountable for conflict minerals. Um, and immediately in that first week, we saw a bunch of executive orders that overturned different aspects of this. And in the end, I think, you know, that that executive order didn't end up um, holding up. They weren't able to overturn the executive order. This portion of Dodd-Frank did get turned over um, with a different mechanism. Uh, but the, the the big things on those first days, if people also remember, you know, there was executive orders that were leaked related to extraordinary rendition, um, opening up of black sites, um, the reinstituting of um, practices that are considered to be torture. That first week was filled with a lot of executive orders or draft executive orders that ended up sort of falling apart along the way. I think the ones that we all saw that stuck around were the, the immigration bans, which of course affected um, Somalia immediately and then later on other countries on the continent. 
Now, so like you said, there's usually um, a lot of continuity in U.S. approach to Africa spanning both Democrats and Republican administrations. Uh, after this brief period of seven months in the Trump administration, you then left that job in the White House. How did you start to see the Trump administration start to depart from some of the previous precedents um, after that on specifically on Africa? Yeah, I think, you know, that that first team, we were all because we were all bureaucrats, you know, we saw that first year, I think, especially you saw very little um, difference between the Obama and the Trump administration. I mean, there were slight changes, you know, inside internally, what we were doing was we were looking at all of our regional continent-wide strategies, our country strategies, and we were trying to apply the direction we were receiving from our leadership, which is, you know, your job over there. It's the president says that we now have an America first policy. What does that mean for Africa? The areas where we did start to see, almost from day one, this departure from the Obama administration was China. You know, originally, like under the end of the Obama administration, China was viewed as, you know, a complex actor on the continent, that in some cases, China was the enemy. In some cases, China was an ally. And so there was a complex understanding of the relationship with China on the continent. Under the Trump administration, China was viewed very differently. China was viewed as the enemy on the continent. And how do we counter that? And so what we immediately saw is that we had to make a shift um, on some of our policies that were um, a little more, they had to become a little more adversarial towards China. Um, you also saw that there was less support for institutional strengthening, civil society, human rights. So it was how do we also make a little bit of a shift so that things were focused on trade and investment. That wasn't anything new. Trade and investment was a massive part of the Obama administration's approach to the continent. But it, be, it went from trade and investment being one of many to trade investment being one of the most important. Do you think there was, in that sense... Uh, more of a narrowing of U.S. focus on the continent rather than really much of a shift, maybe besides the the China question? Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I think it, it probably is a narrowing. The thing that is complicated about this is, you know, we all know that you know the U.S. government, we're planning three years out for budgets and how we're going to prioritize our ambassadorships and staffing. And, you know, it requires such a huge amount of planning in advance. It's hard to make a drastic shift quickly. We'll notice that just now you're really starting to see some of the impacts of the beginning of the Trump administration, because it takes time for these things to fall into place. So I think that you're absolutely right. It was probably just a little bit of a tightening of a focus on trade and investment, China, and you know, double down, doubling down on military solutions um, for all the different challenges that are facing the continent. Yeah, and we did see in a uh, major uptick in, in drone strikes in Somalia. Was that evident from day one in the Trump administration that they might uh, take a, you know, a more aggressive approach on that front? From the beginning, the administration was convinced that some of the problems in West Africa, the Sahel, Somalia could be solved through a military response. And I think Somalia specifically, um, it was being treated as that the solution to Somalia is kinetic. And I think we will all look back and I think we're just able to start doing that now because we've had some time to, to take a look and ask those hard questions about were increased drone strikes helpful in any way? Um, under the Obama administration, there was a lot of uh, positive feedback that was received from you know, the Somali government, regional governments that said drone strikes were really helpful. I think that, that there, the tune changed a little bit the more intense the drone strikes became. But one of the things that's really important about thinking about the U.S. military's involvement, specifically in the Horn and in Somalia, is that we could have, you know, the U.S. government could have the best strategy in the world when it comes to Somalia. That can be a holistic strategy that includes how do you support the government, how do you support different regional governments. But when only one area of that strategy is funded and funded regularly, which is the Department of Defense, it's very hard to have a balanced strategy. So, you know, we saw this even under the Obama administration that if, you know, DOD is the largest operation in the room and there may be, the, you know, under President Obama, DOD, and even at the beginning of Trump, 
Um, the Department of Defense were the only people who were allowed to travel to Mogadishu regularly. They were the only people who were able to leave the airport in Mogadishu. And when you start to look at that, if they're the only people on the ground who are actually able to talk to Somalis, of course the strategy is going to be focused on you know, a military response. And the, the solutions are all going to be seen through the eyes of military you know, experts. Moving on, you know, looking forward to the to the upcoming Biden administration, do you think there are areas in which he will forge a new path on Africa? Or do you think we'll largely see a a reversion uh, to the sort of previous kind of uh, normal, if you will, between U.S. and Africa that was there before? Um, and 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 also, do you think there might be some continuity on this on this China question? You know, there's, whenever it comes to a new administration, I think there's there's two questions, no surprise, that there's the policy question and then there's the people question. And I think when it comes to the policy of the Biden administration, we are going to see a shift. President-elect Biden has made comments about what his priorities are going to be in the United States and a little bit overseas. He's he's talked about domestically it's going to be COVID and it's going to be climate change. You're going to see those exact same themes I think, in his foreign policy. And then multilateralism throughout the campaign, um, both in the primary and in the general, we heard Vice President Biden talking about re-engaging, rebuilding relationships, um, supporting regional organizations. You know, I think that would mean that we should look for the AU and different regional organizations, EGAD or ECOWAS. We're going to see those receiving extra attention and support under the Biden administration. But I think the the biggest signs, actually, that we have about how Biden will prioritize Africa is the people that are being talked about um, who are going to be a part of his cabinet or his senior leadership. And we're seeing a lot of familiar faces, right? Ambassador Susan Rice, um, Ambassador Linda Thomas-Greenfield was just appointed to be in charge of one of the teams that's dealing with how the Biden administration is going to work with the State Department. And for people who don't know Linda, because she's more of a, a West Africa person and then went for all of Africa, she was a you know, former ambassador to Liberia. She was in charge of the State Department's Africa Bureau, and she's leading the State Department's team um, for the Biden administration. And that's a very good sign for Africa. Um, at USAID, Linda Edom was the assistant administrator for Africa. She also was at the White House under President Bush and President Obama um, in the Africa directorate. So we're we're seeing people who um, are old Africa hands in the U.S. and in U.S. government coming into leadership positions already in the transition um, or these transition teams that will, will one day be working on a transition um, from the, the Biden team. Um, I think one of the other things that I'm, I'm ho- I really hope will be a priority for these, um, the new teams coming in, is the importance of putting strong ambassadors forward. You know, I'm not sure what the numbers are at right now, but at one point there were 20 U.S. ambassadorships that were empty on the continent. It's astronomical. I mean, it's hard to imagine the U.S. having a strong relationship with any of the 53 countries if there isn't an ambassador um, sitting there who has the, you know, the support of the White House and of the president. And so I think one of the priorities of this team has to be the appointment of strong ambassadors. Um, And then to the China question, um, you know, I think there's a few areas that I'm watching really carefully. I think China is one. Um, I hope that we move to a more complex understanding of China again, because China, you know, hasn't been all bad for the U.S., for the continent. Um, there's a lot of good things that China has done, like the U.S. There's it's it's complicated. It's not always an easy black and white answer. Um, the other things that I'm watching really carefully, are, of course, human rights. Under the Obama administration, I think one of the things that everyone would reflect on is that at times President Obama was, you know, too forgiving or too kind to um, authoritarian governments or governments that, you know, had a history or were showing a record of human rights violations. I think the Biden team has probably learned from some of those mistakes. The other piece I'm watching is counterterrorism. I think that's the piece that's going to be the most fascinating about this new Biden team. Um, you know, Biden has talked throughout the campaign about like a counterterrorism plus strategy, which is pretty much a continuation of the Obama policy of, you know, fighting violent extremism and, you know, terrorist organizations through special forces, through, you know, strike forces, through drones. 
we should all watch this because um, President-elect Biden has also talked about ending forever wars, and that includes the war on terror. So we might see a shift in this immediate response to fighting terrorism and fragile states with drones and with a military response. And would you say that's that's the area, maybe the, the, the human rights, um, doubling down on that and then maybe a, a rethink of this counterterrorism approach. You think those might be the areas where you might see Biden uh, diverge uh, most substantially from what was there before uh, from the Obama administration and previously? That is what I hope. I, I don't know if I, I'd say that we're going to actually see a change there. I think we should all watch for it. And I hope that is what we see a change in. It is hard if the U.S. government ends up having a divided system where there's a Republican controlled Senate then we're going to see there's going to be some conflict. And, um, you know, the progressive side of the Democratic Party wants to see a shrinking of the Department of Defense's budget, wants to see a change away from this counterterrorism, wants to see a focus on institution building and corruption. I think the Biden team will agree with it, but there's an inertia about the um, counterterrorism mission that is hard to slow down and hard to stop. Talking more about U.S. strategy, which we which we've touched on here, I just want to raise. You know, we hear a lot on on the continent, a lot of disgruntlement. I would say from uh, from African officials um, who think the U.S. in many ways, and and this predates the the Trump administration, although it it did probably get worse under the Trump administration. That the U.S. doesn't really view African countries necessarily as very strategic partners in the same way that that others, um, you know, especially China, uh, seems to sometimes. Um, it's almost a sense that the U.S. has more of a negative strategy, you know, in terms of reducing jihadism, reducing deaths, you know, reducing poverty, but but less of a clear sense of a, you know, positive partnership. You know, what do you think of that characterization? And, and do you think uh, the U.S. has a sort of clear strategy towards towards Africa? So when it comes to strategy for the continent, I really struggle with this. And I think that the Biden team is probably struggling with it as well. You know, when we transferred over to the Trump administration um, and the team, we all sat there and said, OK, what do we want to do as far as a strategy, a Trump administration strategy towards the continent? And we all felt frustrated because how do you have a strategy for 53 countries? How do you have a strategy, you know, uh, for both Nigeria and Djibouti at the same time. What you can do is you can have themes, and that's what we ended up doing. And I think that's what many of the, the my predecessors at the White House had done as well, is that you try and have this theme. You know, as we've talked about, it included things like trade and investment. It included China. It included counterterrorism. Um, under the Obama administration, that included health and youth and democracy, um, along with counterterrorism and trade and investment. Um, and then we tried to move down to regions. So under the Trump administration, we tried to come up with these regional strategies. But one of the challenges is, is you know, you're you're sitting at the White House with these regional strategies or these, you know, a, a continental strategy. And then you have individual ambassadors who each have their own view of how they want to do things. And there's not necessarily a competition, but the ambassadors live in their own world. And so when you have the ambassador to Kenya, the ambassador to Ethiopia, the ambassador to Somalia, all having their own view, it is really hard to have a comprehensive strategy around any of the regions or, or the continent in general. So it's a, it, it is a real challenge. I think the, the other problem is the U.S. government does have a hard time, and I include myself in this, um, having a complex view of some African countries. You know, when we compare ourselves to the way the U.S. government treats countries in the Middle East or countries in Asia or even Latin America or Europe, there's a complex relationship. Some things we get along with countries on and some things we don't. It's it's much more complex. When it comes to the African continent, we've gotten into a very bad habit, you know, either priority country or not, um, ally or not. Not that it's complex, that, you know, um, that a country could be both an ally and we could disagree on something. And we're seeing that play out a little bit in Ethiopia. We're seeing that when Abe came in, the U.S. government identified great Abe, good. Ethiopia is good. Ethiopia has been in the good category in the U.S. government for a while. And so when you, when, when it's moved over there, it becomes harder to hold those governments accountable for anything that's going on. 
it's hard to then realize that this is complicated, that it's not just about one individual who's leading a country, that Ethiopia has a very complex history and it, it, very difficult ethnic relationships that need to be worked out. And it's going to take time and it's actually going to be really painful. And we can't just immediately put you know, a leader or a country into a category and say, OK, great, job done, like move on. I was wanting to ask you whether or not you thought that the U.S. actually had a regional policy towards the Horn rather than uh, what, what it often looks like to me and, and also what it seemed like what you alluded to, that it often just seems to have a bunch more country-specific policies. Other powers outside the continent, you know, I think definitely do uh, look at the Horn of Africa, for instance, as a region and sort of approach it like that. I mean, w what's the barriers to the U.S.? you know, also doing that, what would need to change? You know, the U.S. also has a Great Lakes envoy. It has a Sahel envoy. Could we see a Horn of Africa envoy? Um, you know, but, 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 also, but also just what's the main barriers to getting, to getting U.S. foreign policy to, to thinking, you know, more regionally? Because a lot of the issues that are going on here, of course, span the borders. Yeah, I think, unfortunately, the, the answer is really bureaucratic. Um, we see that, you know, at, at USAID, East Africa... Um, doesn't include Sudan and um, South Sudan, but it includes Kenya and Tanzania. You switch over to the Department of Commerce and the borders are different. At State Department, um, East Africa, you know, uh, maybe doesn't include um, Tanzania or whatever it might be. These the And then the Department of Defense is different. So in every one of these U.S. agencies that have a major role in the, the horn, the boundaries are different of who's in charge. I remember holding meetings at the White House and you would need to invite the, you know, the assistant secretary for the appropriate area. And it was different assistant secretaries. Sometimes you'd had to have two assistant secretaries from one agency. It sounds like an easy thing to fix. But as you can imagine, there, you know, there's entrenched reasons for why those borders are the way they are in um, the U.S. government. You mentioned the, the special envoys. So the special envoys are one way that it can be fixed. I think that this new team that's coming in, they're going to have to ask this really hard question about whether or not special envoys are helpful. And there is a real debate in Washington about whether or not they are. We saw that on the Sudans, on Sudan and South Sudan, having a special envoy was really helpful because it prioritized Sudan and South Sudan in a way that some of the other countries were not. Same with the Great Lakes. There was you know, a prioritization because the people who were in those positions had direct lines to the National Security Advisor, to the Secretary of State, and often to the president because these were, you know, people who were in these jobs were senior enough that they were able to go directly to leadership. The challenge is what I just described. When it comes to funding and it comes to the machine of the U.S. government, the special envoys don't really fit. They add a level, an extra level of bureaucracy. You know, hypothetically think you're holding a meeting at the White House. You're sitting in the Situation Room. You're trying to decide what we're going to do about, um, you know, Sudan and the lifting of the state sponsor of terrorism. So you have a special envoy sitting at the table. You also have an assistant secretary for Africa. You also have, you know, the, the person who represents East Africa. Who's the, who's the voice? And there can create sometimes a little bit of tensions that can make it harder actually to get things done. So the, the new team is really going to have to be thoughtful about the use of envoys. President Obama received quite a bit of, of criticism, actually, for using the special envoys as, as strongly as he did. Um, so we'll, I think it's a, it's a new world now. Um, and so we'll see if the team ag agrees that it's important to have some, some special envoys to get that extra high-level attention. I was going to ask you also about what a Biden approach might be to, you know, it's often called the Red Sea uh, dynamic with the Gulf countries playing an increasing role in the Horn of Africa and that region being more integrated together. I imagine what you just said with the challenges of integrating, you know, a Horn policy together, it's probably like on steroids, that problem when it comes to crossing over to an entire another region. You're, you're absolutely right. I think anyone who knows me knows, though, that I am an optimist. I mean, the reason that I'm a part of all of this is because I believe everything we do, we can do better. When the... Um, 
the administration switched over from Obama to Trump. Um, and I held these meetings with all of the interagency for all of the countries that we had identified as priorities. The first thing that we did is we sat down and we said, we have a new president who nobody knows what he wants to do on Africa. No one knows what he what his approach to Ethiopia is going to be. Okay, we have the smartest people in the U.S. government sitting in this room. What do we want to do differently? And I hope that there's a little bit of that in the new team. That like the new team comes in and says we've had a really rough four years for diplomacy for development. Um, what do we want to do? In the, like as the United States, what do we want our identity to be in the U.S. government when it comes to our support for the African continent um, and when it comes to our partnership? How are we going to become real partners with the continent? Many countries in Africa have demonstrated they're serious players on the world stage, and the United States needs to treat them as such, needs to treat these countries as serious players at the UN, in the multilateral organizations around the world, if we're going to have a successful relationship and a successful partnership. One of the things we've really seen in this Trump administration is that we've seen, you know, a real sort of step backwards, I would say, in terms of the, uh, or leaning backwards uh, diplomatically. I mean, you mentioned the hollowing out of the ambassadors, but also just in terms of when crises arise, you know, and you were often used to seeing the U.S. sort of jump in as at least one of the main lead actors um, in the diplomacy, uh, you you haven't really seen that or you've seen it come about, you know, much later than normal. How do you think a Biden administration will, you know, w- will approach diplomacy on the continent in terms of peace and security and resolving crises? And I mean, the role of Washington in the world is changing. Do you think they view Washington as sort of the the lead dominant actor or just one power among many's? I mean, in, in what way do you think they view that, you know, how the U.S. should act? I think that's actually one area that's going to be a, a shock to everybody. You know, the situation that happened with Ethiopia and um, the GERD and the negotiations around the dam, it's a great example. I, I think that there are people in the U.S. government who believe we're the top dog everywhere, where the U.S. government is the top dog, no matter what region we're talking about. Um, and I think I even found there was a little bit of a shock from some of the um, the new folks who came into the administration when they discovered we actually don't like the U.S. government didn't have a whole lot of le- leverage in certain parts on the certain areas of the continent. Other areas, of course, right? And I think the Horn is one of those areas where there's so much investment, whether it's from the development side, the military side, even the State Department. You know, we have big embassies in many of the countries in the Horn. We have you know the base in Djibouti. We have troops on the ground in Somalia. The Horn is an area where I think. It, the U.S. does feel like they have an, an oversized role. There has been a little bit of a humbling, though, because although we have been gone, you know, the U.S. government has been gone for these last four years in a lot of ways. Other organizations, governments, people have stepped in. And I hope that we're paying attention to who that is, that, you know, regional solutions are the ones that work because, No surprise, the people who live in the region are from the region and can support things. Of course, that solution is going to work better than having some outside power come in and tell everyone what to do. But it's going to require the new team, which once again, most of them are old hands. This new team is going to have to be willing to be flexible and think about how the world has changed over the last four years. I think that's the fear of a lot of people. You know, if we see some of these same folks coming in, um, people are worried that they're just going to revert to that that old relationship. I believe that the, all of these individuals have evolved. They've evolved over the last four years and seen what's happened. They're you know smart people who are um, changing their views of how the U.S. can actually be helpful and not harmful on the continent. As a as a final question, I'm wondering how you think a Biden administration might approach the current crisis in Ethiopia if it's still on the conflict path, you know, that it's currently on? I think they'll, there will be a return to, to what we would have seen under, a, you know, an Obama administration or, or maybe just a little bit more normalcy in um, the pressuring for dialogue. I think you'll see um, a lot more behind the scenes diplomacy, as we've seen with President Trump, one of his approaches, which has actually, you know, in all honesty, has worked in some places, but a very public foreign policy at all times by President Trump. Um, we'll, we'll see a shift to much more 
quiet, behind closed doors, you know, whispering of, hey, I really think we need to return to dialogue. There needs to be, a, you know, more discussion, support for regional solutions, um, you know, pulling in regional leaders to try and, um, you know, provide support uh, in a way that, that, you know, deflects the conflict or, or calms things down a little bit. Um, I think, you know, one of the, the things that's a shocker to everyone is, right, Ethiopia was who we, the U.S. government always leaned on when we were looking for regional solutions, whether it was Sudan or Somalia or anywhere. It was, okay, let, let's try and get Ethiopia to jump in. And now it's hard when it's that, um, that leader is the one that, um, that now needs a little bit of pressuring. But it's a good time for other folks to step up. Uh, on that note, uh, thanks, Brittany. Uh, thanks for taking your time on the, the hot seat and, and, and also uh, for that, I think, very honest, uh, very wide-ranging conversation. Thanks, Alan. As always, thanks for supporting The Horn, and we will be back in two weeks with another episode. You can follow Crisis Group on Twitter at Crisis Group or read our reports at www.crisisgroup.org. I'm Alan Boswell, and this episode was produced by Mae Francis. 